Hi everyone, I'm Stephen and welcome to Audio Nautica. In a previous video I blew up my test speakers. So I got this kit from eBay, which is a speaker delay and protection kit, which will make sure that doesn't happen here again on the bench. And it's also great for amplifiers that don't have a protection circuit. So as I mentioned, I bought this kit on eBay. It uses a UPC 1237, so basically it gives a three second delay on startup and also if it detects DC on the outputs then it disconnects the relay thus saving the speakers. So I'm going to build this kit today. Just before I begin can I please encourage you if you haven't already subscribed do subscribe to my channel. It really helps my channel so much. Helps get the word out to other people that they might like to watch my videos and uh, helps me so much in giving me the encouragement to keep making videos like this one. So let's dive in. And when making something like this, the, the general rule is to start with the shortest components. So basically we're gonna do um, these signal diodes and the resistors we're gonna do first. And to make the folds nice and neat, I've got this piece of plastic and for these diodes, which we're going to do first, I actually need the absolute shortest spacing that I can possibly get, which will be all the way down here. In a production environment, you wouldn't be using a piece of plastic like this. Obviously you can get hand machines that will take um, components that are on tape like this, or you can get mechanized ones, but obviously they're much more expensive than my piece of plastic. Now, fortunately with this board, all the information that you need to assemble it is actually on the silk screen. So, put our diodes in first, making sure they're around the right way, and yeah, that was pretty tight. Put this one in, make sure he's around the right way. See, even that width is kind of really a bit too tight, so I just have to pull it through like so. A pair of pliers. Okay. Now. I could put the other components in now, but once you get a bunch of leads sticking up, it actually becomes more difficult to access the leads. So I'm just gonna do these two diodes first. Trim them off flush to the joint. I'm not trying to cut the joint down, just trying to get it trimmed flush to the joint. And then I like to just, just re-flow the joints because they've had that sort of mechanical stress in cutting the lead off. So that's done. Okay. So now I'm going to fit the 10Ks. With this kind of tape stuff, it's easier just to cut it off like that because the adhesive won't come off the ends. Something a bit bizarre about these components, the legs have all become magnetized and that will be no doubt because they've been floating around in this kit for who knows how long with this relay. 
which of course has got a great big magnet in it. So when I try to trim the leads, they all get stuck onto the end of my side cutters. Then these ones. Now, these are not polarized, so it doesn't matter which way they go around, but it's good engineering practice to fit them all the same way around because it looks neater. One more. Okay. Now I've got two more resistors here. And rather than looking up my resistor color code, I'm just going to measure it. So that one's 3.9K. So this one should be 47K, just check him. And out of range, yep, he is 47K. I think with resistors it's nice to put them just so that they read with the colour code from left to right, which is what I've done. Okay. So now we can solder these guys in. I just soldered one in just to make sure that they're all sitting nicely, which they are, just before I finish off soldering them in. Okay, trim the legs off. Just do what I did before, just reflow the joints. Lovely. All 
Okay, so the next shortest component will be this bridge. Which obviously does need to be around the right way. Otherwise it won't work. Oops. There we go. So because I want this flush to the board, just tack one leg, make sure that it is sitting correctly. And it is. In a production environment, you'd use like a PCB holder. We've just got like a foam base underneath it that the components sort of sit on and it pushes them up. But I don't have one and I've never had one. And I don't think you can really justify one for home use. Okay. So now I'm going to do these electrolytic capacitors. This one's 4.7. So obviously these have to be around the right way. So there's a plus on the silk screen and there's a bar there which represents the, the negative side. So, so that one's 47, sorry. We want the decimal point. It's this one, 4.7. Okay. This one is 100 mics, so he will go there. This one looks like it's 47, so that goes there. That one is 100. And this one is 10. Double check the polarity. Yep, they are all correct. Just want to splay these leads out so they don't fall out when I turn the board over. Oops, missed one. That's better. Now, We want these to be nice and neat so that they're flush against the board. So the only way that we're going to be able to do that, come on, take, is to tack one side. Because it's going to be almost impossible to get them right the first go as you will see in a tick. See how they're kind of all over the place? So what we do is we get our little finger underneath and we just reflow while pushing it on the other side. that will kind of seat the capacitor on flush on the board. Which is kind of a bit easier said than done sometimes.
That's better. See how much neater they are now? That one still doesn't feel quite right. There we go. So now that that's done, I can now solder in the other side. Trim off the leads. just reflow these joints, make them nice again. Okay. So our next shortest component is going to be our UPC. So there is no pin one marking, but I know from the data sheet pin one up is up this end. So that needs to go in there like so. Again, we'll just tack one pin yeah that's fine we don't want it to be sort of like leaning over too much in one direction but that looks fine to me so we'll just solder these other pins in So now these screw terminals, now these are designed to fit together like so. This one together as well. So see how we have been working up in height? This is now the tallest component and I can just do this and it's now sitting on them and it's not going to go anywhere. So again I will just tack them on.
just to make sure that they are sitting correctly. And they are before I solder the other joints. These ones are earth, so heat's really getting sucked out of the joint, but the good old thermaltronics, even with this conical tip, I mean, even for this kind of stuff, I prefer to use the conical tip rather than the chisel tip. My chisel tip's kind of a bit short and stubby. Or as you can see with this conical, I can get just get it right adjacent to the work. And the whole point of soldering is that you're not trying to get the heat in through the tip itself. It's actually the solder itself that conducts the heat into the work. So what I'm doing, if you look carefully, is, is I apply the solder to the iron, which goes molten, and then it flows around the job because solder has a very high surface tension and it will want to do that when it goes liquid. Okay. So we're almost there guys. Um, this is our 7812. Okay. So make sure that that's sitting nicely. There we go. It wasn't quite flush into the board properly. So that's why we're doing stuff like by hand like this. Okay, this is earth, so it's going to take a fair bit of heat, this one. Obviously these need to be trimmed. One component left, which is our relay. There we go. So this is now the tallest component. And so I could just sit the whole board on top of the relay like that. And now just solder it on. So you can probably see that the normally closed contacts, these two here, they're not even connected. There's not even pads there to solder them onto. Which is slightly disappointing, because if you wanted to fit like a, a protection LED to tell you that the thing was in protection, that's what you'd connect it to, I guess. Okay. There we are. So you can now see how simple that was to assemble. But also, see how it's got these blobs of flux all over the back of the board. So, I'm going to clean that off to make it nice and neat. It will work with it there, 
but it won't look very nice. Certainly in a production environment, you clean your board. Now you can use uh, this stuff, isopropyl, very common to use that even in a production environment. But I like to use this stuff, CO contact cleaner, just because it, the ISO will leave a little bit of a mark, like a watermark on the board. Whereas uh, this stuff will not. When I worked in the factory, I actually changed from using ISO to using this stuff because I found just so many other things they did tend to leave marks. Okay. That's looking much better. Clean up the mess. Okay, there we are, one printed circuit board assembly ready to now go into an enclosure. I marked some positions on this box that this is going to go into. So this is made out of polycarbonate. So it's quite soft, so I need to make these pilot holes first. confess I've already made one of these uh, here it is here and I did make a video of that but I wasn't happy with how it turned out so I'm doing it again but hopefully I made all the mistakes on the first video so now you guys don't have to watch them and I must confess I do feel more comfortable with mechanical stuff, or sorry, with electrical stuff than this mechanical sort of stuff. And that hole's not really where it should be. It should have been, it's supposed to be in the middle of the ribs, so it's... Might have just got away with it, I think, hopefully. I think I'm still going to need to stage up before going to the big drill. This stuff is just so soft. Those are the right size already, I believe. So, yeah, look at that. Now, these are going to have to be reamed out because these is what's going in there. 
This is the biggest drill that I have. And that still won't go in, so I need to ream this out. Yep, it's a bit of a tight fit, but oh, gosh. that's fine. Now this one. Hole's getting a bit elliptical, which is not quite, not quite what we want. There we go. Well, maybe just a tad more. Okay, that's good. Now I just need to check the hole size for these banana plugs. This will be the speaker output terminals. I should have actually checked these. Yeah, that'll be fine. I was just worried about them being too big. But that's fine. Got a bit lucky on that one because I forgot what the size of the holes was. Okay, so I've made a big mess now, so I'm going to clean this mess up and I'll be right back. Okay guys, I've been having microphone problems, sorry about that, hopefully it's right now. So these holes are drilled. I just need to clean my lines off. Okay, so next I'm going to put in these banana plugs. So these will be the output terminals. And I'm just going to use a little bit of Loctite Blue, Loctite 243 as well. And they have got a nice solid spring washer on them, but the last thing one wants is these coming out. And especially if one of these is going to be used on my workbench. I don't want um don't want them coming out because of you know, plugs going in and out of them. Okay. So this one here. Come on. So easy to get these things cross-threaded. Hmm. Okay, 
I didn't get the spacing of these very good. They were supposed to be in the centers and I've kind of got them wrong, but anyway, they're in. So I'll put both negatives in the center. Last one. You can see that I got the spacing wrong, but it's not too bad. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to do some flying leads for my output terminals now. Just using a bit of speaker wire just wrapped around the end of these banana plugs. I'll change to the chisel tip because I need good heat for this. There we are. So now I just need to adjust these to the right length. there more or less Okay, so I'll just prep these ends and I'll be right back.
Okay, so now I need to terminate these ends into here. So this is the output side. Okay, that's the output side done. Now for the input side, I'm just going to make up like a little kind of a harness. It's going to have to route through this little connector or this little cable gland. I'm just going to use a couple of figure eights, so I'll make up a little harness for that and be back in a tick. Okay, so here's my little harness that's through this connector, so that will just poke through here. And I need to make sure I don't forget to put this on. Because that would be really annoying to forget that. Okay. <coughs> now we'll attach it. So I'm going to make the the wire with the writing on it, I'm going to make that positive. Uh, loosen these off. Be nice. Not really happy with that. It's like the little doover in the thingy just hasn't quite come up.
next one. Where's the writing? Definitely the bottom one. Which means that one will be Earth. Okay. <clears throat> so that'll sit down there more or less. I won't put this in just yet because I'm going to hook up the power. So that's going to go through this one again, same size. Got a plug pack here. I'm just going to cut the end off it. It's going to go through here. So that through there, this guy through there,
All right. So we are hooked up electrically now. Though we need to see whether it works because I have not tested this yet. So it's just hanging up there off the lead, so it's not shorting to anything. There we go. Seems to be working. So, what I'm going to do, just while it's hanging up in the air like that, <coughs> I'm just going to use some double-sided tape, is how I'm going to secure this board down. It just means that like, I don't want to have to worry about holes or anything through the bottom. They'd look pretty ugly anyway. It's got little rails there. But the board's not the right size for those. So, just a couple of bits of double sided tape. will hold the board down. hope this is going to work because the other thing is is that the board is kind of going to want to go where it's going to want to go if that makes any sense so these wires are fairly stiff relatively speaking so I'm just hoping there's enough flexibility Okay, so I've now got this board stuck in and I've put in these cable clamps in position. I had to cut out one of these slots for a board because I had the hole too close and this nut was fouling on it. So that was a bit of a pain. It's because I didn't measure the hole positions correctly, which I should have got right. But anyway, there you are. So this is all ready to go now electrically so if I plug this in it gives us a three second delay on power up which is meant to do so if I turn on my Tektronix TM5006 with its PS501 power supply which I made a video about by the way now if I hook this up so I've got about 12 volts if I turn the output on straight away you can see that the relay disconnects itself, disconnects the outputs, which is kind of what it's meant to do. And when the DC goes away, it resets itself. Now, if I change the polarity, because we want it to work for both negative and positive voltages, put the DC back there, same thing happens. And if I change to the other channel input, just took itself a little while to reset that time. There we go. 
if I change the polarity again. There we go. Now, just reset it again. I'm going to take the voltage down to zero volts and it should kick in about 550 millivolts. Okay, that was about 700 at that time, but you know, it doesn't matter. Um, this last time I tested it, it was on 500. It might have been on the other channel. I expect a bit of variation, but look, that's really, you know, that's kind of fine. dropping out about 400. Yeah, 700 it's kicking in. So this gives us DC protection on our speakers and it gives us a startup delay so that we don't get a nasty thump, so that's really, really good. I'll just turn that guy off. So all that is left to do now is to put the lid on. There we are, put the lid on and our job is done. So one speaker delay protection box made out of an eBay kit. I hope you enjoyed my video. Please subscribe to my channel. It really helps me, helps other people to find my channel. And give me a thumbs up if you liked my video. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye for now.